So now it gives me great pleasure to introduce Ali Raza uh, Padania today. Ali Raza has a master's in filmmaking um, and is a founder and director at Unicrew Productions, where he works in video editing, video production, animation, amongst many other skills. And he creates films, commercials, and documentaries. One of the short films that he's been involved in in the past um, won an international category award in the National Film Festival for Talented Youth, which was held in Washington. He was also the cinematographer for the series Close to Home uh, by Prince Ali, uh, Prince Ali Muhammad Aga Khan. So on that impressive note, uh, we're really privileged to have Ali Raza bringing his wealth of experience in filmmaking. And we're very grateful for him sharing his time and expertise with us today. So over to you, Ali Raza. So um, today's session, I wanted to take you guys through um, what is filmmaking, what are the fundamentals, what are the basic uh, breaks, um, what are the categories, and what are the further categories of uh, filmmaking? How do you how do you go um, on a proper storytelling format? What do you have to consider when you using any or you choosing any genre? which could be whether you're into a sci-fi, you're into action, you're into um, rom-com or just comedy, uh, then it's not just the story, but also thinking about how does, uh, how does the visualization work? Uh, what, is, what is that you have to consider when you're doing a comedy? What should be uh, the lighting and the mood and what are the color palette that you use? Uh, so we're gonna go through that process so I'll begin my slide with uh, showcasing what are the individual areas. So as you all know, there are three main fundamentals, which is pre-production, production, and post-production, right? And then each of them have further categories as well. I will just talk through, because we have a small, uh, we don't have much time. So in an hour session, I, I'm, I'm gonna try as much as I can cover. So in pre-production, there is narrative, there's script, and their screenplay, and we'll get into the details as well. Then when you go into the production, there is um, direction, production design, cinematography, uh, um, or the camera work, or however you wanna define it. We'll further talk in detail as well. Then there is post-production, which is sound, editing, as you know, but editing has the details of how do you align your sound, how do you color grade things, uh, how do you create the mood of the film, so um, we all have seen movies like uh, Batman and we all can relate to the two big DC and Marvel, how they mood, how they create the mood, right? Um, what's the lighting like? What's the color correction like? Uh, what's the contrast like between the highlights and the shadows? And why do we like certain mood uh, when we see the DC with Batman for, for that matter? The recent one we saw, the epic uh, sequence at the end where um, you could see it's a it's a pr frame on some high-rise building and a sunset behind <coughs> behind him and he has it having a, a deep conversation so how does light or the mood or the contrast or the color help you what is uh, why do people like the golden hour as we say it? uh what's, what's what's the purpose behind if you're telling an emotional and a connection and a bonding feel why why do we use a warm light to it uh when we show like a blue tone to the, the cooler tone to it, what's the purpose of that? So we get into the details about that. So let's, let's begin with uh, pre-production and the detail about what is, what is script and uh, what is screenplay, what is narrative, what is plot? Uh, how, do you, how do you differentiate between uh, all of this? So if I, if I have to say just the the basic of it, if a screenplay is a written document that describes a visual story meant for the screen, then a script can be a written document meant for anything uh, regardless of the medium. So a basic script um, can be, I'm just telling a story of, uh, let's, 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 let's take the example of the Titanic and everybody knows the plot, everybody knows um, how it unfolds. And why, uh, so if you break it down into what's the script, uh, what, what is the screenplay, what is the detail of screenplay, what is plotting. So the Titanic is a, is a, it's an all-time favorite, everybody's um, 
romantic story, right? It's a, it's a love story. And how it's broken down is, let's take it as, there's two words, um, utopia and dystopia. That's the state everybody goes through. And it's up to you how you unfold their story, right? How, how you want to tell their story. So this guy, Jack, is all happy-go-lucky. He's just enjoying, he's just traveling. Um, so he's in a, in a very uh, utopia state and then sees the girl and he's like, no, I want this girl. And that goes into uh, the state of dystopia, which is he wants to, you know, get the connection he can't and he's fighting for it. And then, you know, you get into so. So the plotting divides between the state of utopia and the dystopia. And that you can choose how you want to unfold your story, which is the plotting. We'll, we'll get into further details as well later on, and I'll show a video as well, which basically describes um, how uh, the three act plays with the reference of the movies as well, and how they, uh, they choose between what state you are, what's the act, and where your climax come in, which is your middle point. And if I have to, I don't know if you guys have seen, I, last night I saw this movie called Javan. And for the first half, we were just very confused of what's happening because Shah Khan is just end up in a river and then somebody is helping. Sorry, that's it. A disclaimer is a spoiler alert. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, to tell you the to tell you the plotting and how it works is um, you could either just open a story with with a suspense and somebody just enters the door and then shoots at you and you're like, who is this guy? Who's shooting? And you want to know it, right? So. This characterization building up, uh, you want to know the person and why he's shooting. So you, 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 um, you open your story with a dystopia and you want to know who's there, what's happening and why it's happening. Uh, that actually hooks the audience uh, to know and be engaged. I want to know their story, which is the non-linear way, right? And we'll get into that as well. And there's the other way is linear way. Just start a story, just standard Karan Johar movie. Uh, a happy family just going about, rich family. And it's a linear way of finding is there's a family going on, suddenly something happens, that's your dip, and then, uh, you know, uh, everybody's fighting to come together, and uh, um, and that's the state. Non-linear is just opening the story with the suspense and then going about it. So you choose the state. So um, that's just describing what the script is. Then... When we talk about screenplay, screenplay is the detail of when you have the script, uh, a director, a, a cinematographer, a production design team, everybody uh, would know um, how we want to work around it. So, like I said before, the guy comes in and um, uh, a shoot a person and then that's how your opening is, which is your script. Now, screenplay is the detail of uh, if I'm doing a Rohit Chetty style, which is, you know, bang, bang, big frames and all of that, or or um, the screenplay would define, is he holding the gun in the right hand or the left hand? Is he coming from the door as a big gate or whatever? What's the light like? What is the mood like? Is it a day sequence or a night sequence or an evening sequence, whatever it is? Where is the person who he's going to shoot? Where is he sitting? So that defines your screenplay, which is the detail of, how the action is happening. Um, so you basically, the production design team could know uh, how my prop is gonna be, how my art direction is gonna be. And characterization detail as well. What was what, his expressions like and everything. Um, and then we'll give you example of that as well. <clears throat> now, the story is the action of the movie and the plot is how you, uh, uh, how the story is, is told. The narrative structure can be either linear and non-linear like I explained. So, so hopefully you get the idea of what plotting is, which is defining or knowing how do I want to tell the story, where my climax is going to be, and it can be back and forth. Uh, one of the one of the great example of non-linear uh, movie I would say is Inception, where you don't know which part you lending in. Uh, is he in the current state or is he in still in his dream? Um, that can also be defined with the with the color tone. If you uh, look at it carefully, you might have seen that all his um, current scenarios were shown in a warm tone and all his dreams and stuff like that were shown in a, a bit cooler tone. 
uh, that you can de de decide in, uh, when you're writing your script. Then why characterization is important. Um, first, I'll tell you what, what are the ways of uh, characterization. One is direct approach and indirect. For saying the word out loud is very simple, but uh, to understand is not difficult either. Direct approach is you would have seen um, a voice of God, which is somebody narrating the story. In a, in an Indian cinema, we uh, we we have seen a lot many times. Amitabh Bachchan is the grand voice, the voice of God, explaining what the family is, who the person is, how uh, is basically establishing uh, the character. Uh, the pers persona of the person, what is the personality, um, and also you have also would have seen an English movie. I would say Hobbit. Uh, there is a voice of God which is explaining how what their experience are, how the story is unfolding in in their manner, and um, that you can decide how you want to do it. Non-linear way could also be um, not saying anything, but you see a person behavior and you analyze like uh, um, we see in the movie Joker and uh, we, we realize with the action nobody establishing who the person is what it what his background is and why he's behaving in the way he's behaving so non-linear ways checking the details of um, why is he behaving in a certain way yeah, he's lonely he lives in a house he can't, he, he can't afford normal things and then people make fun of him and his behavior gets you you would, you would see in the transition throughout the movie, um, and the idea of uh, indirect characterization is that um, the behavior should explain everything uh, that we have said. Now, get into the details of um, the three act structure that I explain that uh, every movie. That again, what I'm trying to explain today is a very. These are the rules. Once you know the rules, you, you know you can break it as well and you can do however you want to do it. So there is a three act structure to storytelling and that basically defines um, the state of, like I mentioned earlier, the utopia and dystopia stage. You can define uh, or you can, you can choose whatever or however you want it. That what's going to be my first stage? Is it opening with a, like I said, happy-go-lucky or bang start that there is a there's a climax in the beginning not a climax but sorry what i mean is there's a suspense in the beginning and then you you get to know the further stage so we'll get into the detail i'll show you a video as well the first part is the hook uh, the first bit is knowing um whatever is happening in the beginning why the certain thing is happening and what is it to do with the character, the main character, the protagonist, and the uh, antagonist as well? And uh, that's when the audience would choose that I want to continue with the film or, or not. Uh, the inciting event is the first event that actually the better idea would be that I show you the video that you can, you can understand uh, better. So I will play a video which will describe you the three acts and then we'll talk further and uh, hopefully we'll take questions after that. The first of which is the hook. The opening of your film must answer one question above all else. Why should the audience keep watching? I believe whatever doesn't kill you simply makes you a stranger. Fast Five opens with an action-packed jailbreak before delivering any exposition. Hooks should also serve as a taste of what's to come. By the end of your film's hook, the audience may still have questions, but they know enough that they are invested. Help me, Obi-Wan Kenobi. It's time to kickstart your story with the inciting event. The inciting event happens about 12% into your film and sets the narrative in motion. For an inciting event to have sufficient impact, stakes need to be built beforehand. The beginning of Doctor Strange establishes Stephen Strange as a brilliant surgeon. 
so when the inciting event irrevocably injures his hands, we understand that this has changed his life. No one could have done better. I could have done better. The profession which gives him purpose has been ripped away. Until they reach the first plot point. Occurring about 25% into a film, the first plot point segues a story into its second act. As such, the first plot point is the culmination of the first act, the climax of what has been set up so far. Typically, it is a point of no return. The protagonist's journey is fully underway. In Lord of the Rings, this is when Frodo leaves the Shire. This is it. This is what? If I take one more step, it'll be the farthest away from home I've ever been. There is no going back now. His quest to destroy the ring has begun. Remember what Bilbo used to say? It's a dangerous business, Frodo, going out your door. Much of the beginning of the second act is the protagonist reacting to this plot point. I'm never going to be able to sleep out here. As the protagonists take in the new world they've entered in the beginning of the second act, they are then introduced to the first pinch point. The first pinch point can normally be found around 37% into a story. The pitch point is the first of many obstacles a protagonist must face in the second act. The first pinch point often directly sets up the coming midpoint. In Aladdin, the first pinch point is when Aladdin obtains the lamp, which allows for the midpoint, the reveal of the genie. Ten thousand years will give you such a crick in the neck. Hang on a second. In Jurassic Park, the first pinch point comes when the tour is cut short by an impending storm. This hints at the true conflict between man and nature. There's nothing I can do. The captain says we gotta go. We gotta go. Once your protagonist navigates the first pinch point, they are thrust into the midpoint. The midpoint can also be considered the second plot point. It occurs halfway through a film and has major ramifications on the story. Jurassic Park boasts one of the most iconic midpoints in cinematic history. The T-Rex escape, Wyland notes. The midpoint also challenges Grant's worldview. Grant has firmly established he doesn't like kids. Kids? You want to have one of those? And with the T-Rex's escape, he is now forced to care for two of them. The midpoint then takes us to the second pinch point. Oh, nice boy. The second pinch point occurs approximately 62% into a screenplay. It functions similarly to the first pinch point. In Iron Man, the second pinch point lays the groundwork for the next plot beat. When were these taken? Yesterday. I didn't approve any shipment. Well, your company did. Well, I'm not my company. Tony realizes Obadiah has pushed him out of the company's executive board and is continuing to sell missiles. Who do you think locked you out? I was the one who filed the injunction against you. It's the only way I can protect you. This betrayal sets up the showdown between the two characters. The third plot point ushers the story into its final act, usually occurring three quarters into a film. The third plot point can also often be a character's darkest hour. In Mad Max Fury Road, this is when Furiosa discovers the green place has been destroyed by contamination. The soil. We had to get out. We had no water. And the water was filth. It was poisoned. It was sour. And then the crows came. Considering she's been searching for the green place the entire film, this is a devastating blow. It's finally time for the climax. 
The climax, occurring within the final 10% of the film, is the ultimate culmination of the story so far. As such, the moment should fulfill your character's arc. Sarah Connor's climactic battle with the Terminator completes her transformation from unassuming citizen to the hero of human civilization. Sometimes the climax is the very last moments of a film. But more commonly, there is a resolution which allows for the events of the climax to sink in. In Forrest Gump, Jenny's death is the climax. But the film ends showing Forrest taking care of the child, infusing some happiness into an otherwise glum ending. I want to tell you I love you. I love you too, Daddy. Right, so this hopefully um, defines you how this works. So if you take an example of what we have seen right now, um, either Mad Max, uh, let's, let's take an example of Mad Max. So the third plot, plot point basically is the whole struggle of her finding the green land and she doesn't at the third stage, third plot point. It could have been, assuming you choose, that the third plot point is my first one, that I start the film as she's trying to find something and she doesn't, but how she works around uh, to make her way, making the, the place for, uh, you know, viable for all the, all the people she likes. And that could be a different way of telling the story. But the idea is that you choose how you want to tell the story, how you want to start uh, your story, what's your middle point, what's your end point. So these are the two uh, major areas which is we're going to talk about this. The, uh, we're going to go gradually into the production, which basically describes how do you choose your camera movement, how do you choose your lighting and whatnot. But the first important thing is the pre-production. That's the strongest part because that's when you, you have laid out everything on paper, what your story is, how you're going to tell, uh, what your characterization uh, would be. Uh, like they gave the example of Jurassic Park as well. They build up in the beginning, in the first two plot, that uh, he doesn't like children. But then uh, he, by the third plot point, you know that he's caring for them, he's, he's working or he's just giving his life away to save those uh, kids. So, um, uh, yeah, so the first part is important that you, you align your pre-production, including the characterization, the script. But also, uh, when I talk about production design, which will, will come forward as well, is how do you set your story? What's the mood? Um, uh, what's the idea? So Jurassic Park, there's a whole, you know, it's like a, it's like a world which is we haven't seen before. Similarly, Mad Max. So in your visualization, you would you would think about how my world is going to look like. We'll, we'll, um, I'll show you a few examples as well. I did a few experiments to uh, show how AI can also help, and then we'll talk about it. That I don't know if you have seen this uh, or you have read this book called The Conference of Birds. The Conference of Birds is, is um, if, you, if you see in detail, it's like, um, these are seven valleys that they go through and every valley has a challenge and, and uh, they have created a visualization of how each valley would look. There is also different uh, birds and their characterization of how they are attached to each valley and what they find in the end. Now same thing if you visualize that it was a world that you could think about rather than birds, these are uh, different tribes and people. And they're going through the valley. How uh, that would look like is just me, uh, you know, experiment around with the AI, and I'll show you some pictures as well. And how you can, if you don't have the crew and you still want to do a submission, you can do it yourself. You can go online, um, just type it your imagination. It would give you an image, and that image can also be converted into video, short videos which you can compile. You can add, like I mentioned earlier, that. Uh, when you do the characterization, it could be direct or indirect. So direct could be you could add a voiceover to this and explain your story. Uh, if you don't want to have voiceover or characters acting it out or have dialogues, you could just do a whole story with just a voiceover and a grand music to it. So before moving to the production part, if you have any questions, uh, you can put it on the chat box and I will uh, know as well. Um,
if we get something now, we'll entertain right now. If not, we can we can definitely answer to it later on as well. Do we have questions? I, I think we do. So we have one question. Are there any advantages or disadvantages to using other structures like four or seven act structure? So amazing question. So like I said, this is, uh, this is you know, you, if you know the rules, then you can break it and you can break it well and you can you can tell your story see the idea is with with um with filmmaking or any other art there's no there's no boundary to it uh but you need to know your basics to then break it to any level that you want um the only thing is that you need to be mindful of the audience can be uh it doesn't get distracted to who am I seeing or what am I watching or what's happening? Uh, again, giving you an example of some of the movies that just a basic rom-com, you are just given the first um, current John movie, again, uh, Student of the Year. I saw, I don't like it, but my wife was watching it and I was like, what's happening? Because it starts with a, with a song and then it just keep, the characters keep coming in and I don't know who's who and you know, who's the main character and then who's the cousin or the brother or the friends or the wife or whatever. So you need to know um, how you want to lay it off. Again, it's current draw choice to start with that and then build up the characters and establish that. So you can break into seven to eight. Um, it, it's up to you because there are only three di divisions. In between those three divisions, you can have whatever you like. Two further uh, points. Five further points are up to you. The more the dip, it's fine. You only need to also keep in mind that you need to give a, a breathing space in between for audience to just grasp what they saw. And, and just, uh, you know, uh, if it's emotion, just let them, you know, have those emotions and just take in uh, rather than just jumping up and down. It'd be too much. So it has to have the breathing space as well, if that answers the question. Yeah. Do you have any other questions? No, okay. We can take it later on as well. You can you can uh, put through your questions. Moving on to production. So, production is the part when you uh, when you you know exactly what you're doing in your pre-production, but that's just uh, knowing everything on paper. Once you come on the ground, the reality is very different. You could have many challenges. You could have unforeseen things that um, a with the we living in UK, we we are very uh, we are very well aware of how the climate could change. You could be expecting a sunny day, and you could be planned a very nice uh, golden hour shot, and then suddenly it's raining in the morning. So you could have challenges like this. Uh, this and then the idea is to know how do you work around with the budget. You have your crew with you. You have your camera and crews and this and that and then all the equipment. Do you still go forward with uh, yes, I'm going to put a skimmer and have a big 12 kilowatt light to put a, a emit as a as a sun ray. Whatever it is, is your idea, but the uh, the challenge is always going to be there. Uh, somebody gets ill or whatever. I remember the first commercial I did, um, it was a night shoot. It was supposed to be just uh, at the, at the, after the dawn of the light. And um, the actress come in and she she has the red eye and obviously we have to do a close-up as well um she comes to me she's wearing glasses she takes it off and is like i'm really sorry this is what happened so probably her cousin or her child just pokes her finger into her eyes and she's all red and now we want to finish before 5 30 because it's just going to be light again and we don't have a budget to reshoot on the second day you have the big bigger crew 50 extras dancing in the background and whatnot now, uh, at three, she put her drops in the beginning and we do all the wide shots and the master shots, just not the close-up. We said three o'clock, she's taken to the hospital, uh, puts uh, drops in everything. And I don't know how, it was her friend at the hospital. She said, if you open your eyes again, any, any sharp lights go in your, li uh, in your eyes, you might lose your uh, eyesight. Um, again, she was, I'm grateful she was professionally committed to the, to the cause and she came back. I said, okay, we're going to frame everything, light everything. You keep your eyes closed, shut. 
uh, till we say rolling and then you open your eyes, do your act. Because when you're doing commercial, it's 30 second commercial. The shot is barely 20 second, but that 30 second commercial takes you even days. So luckily, just before 5.30, we ended the thing. So these are the challenges you never know could, could arise, but you have to plan for it. Now in production, uh, you would have done your pre-production, uh, pre you would have known what kind of lighting we are doing, what kind of equipment we need. You would have done your recce of the location. So uh, you would exactly know when the sun is gonna, there are apps as well, and you can go online and see sun position is one of them, that knowing where my light is gonna fall, what's my background is gonna be. Do I want a rim light, which is a backlight? Do I want a proper fill light? And that decision again is depending on the genre. So you would have seen many um, comedy movies, has a very diffuse light to it. And you would see a popping colors and whatnot and everything like that. And similarly, if you're doing a horror movie or an action movie, there's always a strong key light and just a fill, uh, which creates a shadow in between uh, to create that contrast and the mood. So um, the idea is to know, first is production design that we spoke about earlier as well. Production design, that includes the setting of the film, the props and the sets required for filming, camera angle and special effects if there are, and the costumes worn by actors. So. This comes into the place that if you're going to bigger, bigger production, uh, like we saw Hobbit as well, there's a production design, the place that it doesn't exist and suddenly they, they make it happen uh, by creating bigger sets. What are the, the costumes? Uh, do they have swords? We're gonna get that. If it's gonna be interacted with an actor, the prop has to such that it doesn't affect the actor, but you know, uh, it looks like the, the actual. Um, if special effects, uh, you know, how if somebody has a bigger ear, we have to put that on. Uh, so whilst we're talking on this, I should mention there are two things uh, that we know. Um, VFX and SFX. SFX is the special effects that we use, uh, which is your, as you also know, the makeup artist, the get, get up artist does it, right? And then VFX is what you do in the post-production that we'll talk about. But that's the difference. So SFX is what you do during the shoot. VFX is what you do in the post-production. So um, we'll talk about, uh, the so first point is cinematic lighting. So to know any lighting, you need to know what are, how the lighting works. There is, first there is uh, the source light, um, and then there is uh, man-made light, which we also call as the practical lighting. So source light is only two major uh, that we know, which is the sun and the moon, right? And then you create, if there's a lamp post, that's your practical light, how it's going to image to my actor, how it's going to come across, how it's going to look, which depend on your mood. And then the ambient light. So, so whenever you get to a location, you get into a room, you see how the sun is flowing, which is your ambient light, and then you create your practical. Am I going to put any lamps in it? Uh, um, am I putting wall lamps or standing lamps? Is it some neon light from outside emitting inside? That's also a part of um, uh, practical lighting. So these are the way which uh, we need to work around. Then there is high key lighting and low key lighting, which is the major, uh, major difference between either you're creating a, like I said, comedy movie, then it's all like diffuse, which is the high key lighting because if there's a higher source as well, there's going to be bounce that you will see from the wall, from the ground, or whatever. At the same time, there's a low key lighting like Batman, which is one key source, but everything else is diffused. So what, in filmmaking, what you do is you basically cut the light by using a black cloth or anything to, to, uh, to basically cut all the reflections that are coming uh, on your face. And that leads us to the camera movement which is the second part, most important, uh, because it defines what you're trying to say through your camera movement. Uh, emotion scene, many of the time you have seen either if the character is too strong and you want uh, people to just stay on that, you sometimes use a very static uh, shot. And it could also be if it's a dialogue, you sometimes also just push in. 
slowly going in. So what are what are the camera movement? Uh, what depicts what? You're gonna see a video again, which will define uh, and explain what, what's in the part. So I'm just gonna play a video again that should show and explain what it is. And Let's begin with a shot that has no camera movement at all. This is the static shot. In this scene from 12 Years a Slave, the static shot holds on Solomon's lynching. He is helpless and we are not allowed to look away. Its cruelty is amplified by its stillness. Let's move on to our next camera movement, the pan. A pan rotates the camera horizontally, left or right, while remaining in a fixed location. Pans can be used to follow a character's actions or be used to reveal information. A slow pan builds anticipation, while a rapid pan heightens the energy of a shot. These are known as whip pans. Director Damien Chazelle uses whip pans to create relationships between characters. In La La Land, he amps up the energy in the scene, while underscoring the growing synergy between Sebastian and Mia. But what about the vertical axis? The tilt. A tilt directs the camera upward or downward. Filmmakers use tilts to capture the verticality of a film's world. This can be used to give a character dominance or vulnerability. Yes, we're men. Men is what we are. Similar to a pan, a tilt can reveal information, like a character, setting, or scale. Our next camera movement takes us inward. Push in. The push in shot moves the camera towards the subject. Pushing the camera is all about emphasizing a moment. Get our informers to find out where it's going to be held. A visual cue to the audience that this is important. A public place, a bar, a restaurant, some place where there's people so I feel safe. But if Clemenza can figure a way to have a weapon planted there for me. You can push in on an external detail such as an object. Or text. In doing so, filmmakers can direct our attention to a specific detail. Or it can capture a character's thought process. Like in this moment from the post, when Ben comes to terms with exposing the infamous Pentagon Papers. which leads us to our next camera movement. The opposite of the push-in is the pull-out. Unlike pushing in, pulling the camera de-emphasizes the subject, a sort of signal to disconnect from the characters. It can unveil the context of a scene, its setting, or its characters. Our next movement directs our attention without moving the camera at all. Enter the zoom. A zoom may not be a camera movement per se, but there is movement created in camera. Zoom shots change the focal length of a camera's lens to zoom in or zoom out. 
Similar to pulling back a camera, zooming out can reveal the context around a subject, like this opening shot from The Graduate. Zooms are unique because there is no equivalent in the human experience. Like a push-in, we can physically move closer to a subject, but our eyes can't zoom, making this camera movement unnatural. Shouldn't we give the authorities or something? No. Let's move on to our next camera movement, the tracking shot. A tracking shot physically moves the camera through a scene, typically following a subject. Tracking shots differ from push-ins or pull-outs because they don't simply move toward or away from a subject. They move with a subject. The subjects are on the move and the camera tracks with them wherever they go. When done purposefully, they generate two questions. Where is this character going? And what will happen when they get there? This is perfect for long takes that are meant to immerse the audience directly into a scene. Like in this long take from three billboards outside Ebbing, Missouri. Director Martin McDonough opts to use a handheld tracking shot to create a visceral documentary style effect. It also draws our attention to specific actions, like when we see Officer Dixon flip his gun at the last moment, deciding to not shoot. And it touches the soldier. What the hell's going on? <laughs> he heeds his master's voice. Tracking shots can be engaging by following the actions of a character. But how do you create energy in a shot where characters are standing still? Consider the arc shot. The arc shot is a camera movement that orbits around a subject. This orbit is typically a horizontal arc, but it can also be vertical. Arc shots add dynamic movement when characters may be standing completely still. Like in this hero shot from the Avengers, which unifies them as a single unit against surrounding threats. Arc shots keep our focus centralized on the subject from moments of intimacy, panic, or heroism. Most camera movements are highly precise, controlled, but sometimes filmmakers want to produce movement without control, which brings us to our final camera movement, random movement. Random camera movement is defined by camera shake, incidental zooms, or any movement that happens on the fly. Camera shake is often added subtly to create a subjective experience for a more intimate effect. Arbitrary zooms and random camera movement can be used stylistically to create a documentary look. Institutions treat these CEOs like they're as solid as treasury bonds and they're going to zero. No, it can't be right. Which is a technique that Adam McKay uses in the big short. You're managing a fund of, what, 555 million? I don't know how to be funny. I don't know how to work people. I, I just know how to read numbers. Let's begin with the shot that has... Amazing. So hopefully this gives you an idea of um, what generally the camera movements are and what it means. Uh, then again, it's not to limit you. This is what it, uh, it only does. You can always use certain camera movement for a different kind of scenario. So giving you an example, um, um, the art short that they mentioned is more of a heroic or intimacy and stuff like that. But it, it, other than that, you would have seen Batman, the first argument they had uh, on the rooftop is also an art short, but very slow one. It's just the, the camera is like a continuous shot, is moving 360 angle, and then they are having their conversation. So again, this is not to limit you or to restrict you that you can only do this for that 
purpose. But if you know it, you can break it and use for any any um, other scenarios. Now, when we when we talk about production, and I'm sure you might have these questions as well that we can't afford these cameras, we can't have these lights. So, like I said, mentioned earlier as well, I will speak about the AI, but it doesn't matter. And I give you an example. There's a recent movie coming uh, up soon, probably next month. It's called The Creator. Um, and you can have a look at the, uh, the, uh, the trailer as well, and you will be amazed and you, you will think it's some big AI camera or red camera. But actually, it's a Sony camera FX3, which you will see in the weddings as well. It's a, this tiny. Um, and uh, it's normally used for weddings or corporate interviews and stuff like that. But they are using it for uh, a greater film like that, the creator. So just Google it and, and you'll be amazed. So the idea is it doesn't matter what equipment you have. You can have your iPhone. And nowadays, iPhone has this cinematic look as well, which could give you this depth of field, which everybody is amazed of having a bouquet at the background, the blurred background. But knowing how you're going to use your light, uh, a lot many times people always think uh, backlight, the face is going to be dull, and I don't like it. If you notice cinematic uh, lighting, most of the time, the sun is from here to here from the back 180, which creates a rim light. And then the only support the character with a soft diffuser could be just a cardboard, uh, um, a poly sheet or whatever. But um, I would recommend that even if you don't have a professional camera, you can use your iPhone and make the films. The important thing is make sure the sound is right. And for the sound solution, whether you can buy it or not, you can even rent it. There is this platform called Fat Llama and we're gonna uh, put in the uh, chat box as well so you can google it uh, it's called fatllama.com there you can just rent your equipment uh, from a professional camera to to audio system and everything the idea is the audio is very important and I say it's very important um, and you can you can just experience a horror movie without a sound and you can tell me if you would be as scared as you would with the sound. And most many times you just take your headphones off or just mute them when uh, the action is about to happen. So um, make sure the sound is right. Uh, then uh, you can work with your iPhones as well. You can always connect the mic. Now people do vlogs and they know it. You can just attach a mic to the phone and still make it. Um, but the idea is make sure uh, fine, if you cannot have a, a tracking, you might can use a small gimbal, uh, which is a stabilizer that you can use for your phones as well. And, um, or if you want to just put on a tripod, static, you don't have much budget, uh, make sure you do the lighting right. Control, use, try use your iPhone to this. And I wanted to give another example of, I'm not sure it was covered, but I just wanted to quickly cover one frame and i'll show you how framing should work and how you should use it so if you can see my frame and this is called the rule of third yeah and it it, it, it basically works for um whether you're doing photography videography that's the framing guidelines again you can break it however you want it now if you see those interacting points one two three and four. These are the, uh, these are the interesting point um, where your eye, eyes fall first, whether on the left side or the, left, the right side. Whether you're making a, a full frame, a medium frame, a bus shot or a close up or extreme close up, just the eyes. You make sure your interesting point that I am right now center aligned, right? And that could be my idea as well, or I could be left aligned and my eyes or my face is on the rule of third again now it could be on this side or that side the other thing that you make sure is when you're having a dialogue somebody speaking to someone the leading space has to be right again we don't want to get into much detail i will just say this is called 180 rule that you don't break which then don't confuse the audience that who am i looking to where the person is sitting 
So somebody is sitting on my right, right hand side, then my profile would be this and my leading way, which is this space, this negative space, guides me that I'm speaking to somebody on my right. And if I do the same, I'll profile myself slightly this way on the left, which is the leading space on this side, gives you the idea that I'm speaking to somebody. Now imagine if you have a frame, the person is speaking on the right hand side, which is mine right now, and the person listening is also on the right hand side, then you will be confused how are they overlapping? Why are they? So if I'm speaking, I should be on this side and the person listening should be on this side of the frame. Then it makes sense they're having a conversation. Otherwise, so these are certain points that you should uh, you should consider when you, you're making a frame. And rule of third, just wanted to uh, go through quickly that uh, these interesting points, uh, you should keep in mind when you're making your frame that whether it's a character, whether it's a large shot or mid shot, uh, you should keep your characters, either the face, the body, if it's a white shot, or the close-up, the eyes should be on these interesting points. Again, a rule, you can always break it. And the basic rule of framing a landscape is to have, generally, people have 70-30 ratio, which is 70 sky, 30 ground, or 70 ground, 30 sky. Again, you can break them. And the other one is try find... Uh, leading lines, horizon lines, uh, perspective lines, the geometry is there that creates that amazing frame that you see uh, usually in movies. Um, I think I have covered mostly on the production side. Now, if we have any question on the production, can you take it now and then we go to post production? So we do have a question. So there is one question. It actually came just after the pre-production session. Um, is there a rule in which act you can jump in time so the memories and um, what happens prior? Right, so we have seen, and it doesn't, not many directors now use it, but we used to see in the previous 10 15 years ago. A flashback was a very common thing that they would take you through as a time back. Um, now, like I said, you can decide what your plot is and how you want to unfold it and that's why you can also choose whether you want to start from the past again a linear format or non-linear format to start from the present and go in the past and showcase what happened so it's entirely up to you how you want to create the plot and unfold your story and that answers the question any uh, any other question okay so moving on to the post-production post-production is um, has a lot many details we only know as editing which is just putting your uh, footage together layout properly have the sound and the music but post-production is a lot more than that sometimes the film is written or commercially is written in a very different format and we come on to the editing form, uh, phase we sometimes just change it entirely the storytelling process and that is in the hands of the editor who's also a storyteller that I can maybe tell the story in certain, some other way that is not written um, but editing is how you would transition between the scene it doesn't it shouldn't seem like you know I'm having a conversation suddenly I'm somewhere else you pre-plan your transition as well but the editor makes it very smooth with the sound uh, with the like we spoke earlier as well the color correction is the major part in post-production, which defines the mood as well. You might have shot uh, the film in a normal format or a normal color dog, but you sit in the post-production and decide, maybe I want to make it like a cooler tone to give it as um, um, he's, he's missing, he's in a very diff different emotional state. Maybe when he's happy and he's, he's, he's joyful, maybe my colors would be a warmer tone, just to give a basic idea. But that comes in the post-production. And um, like we said earlier as well, sound is very important. Sometimes you're shooting outdoors. It's a lot windy and um, you can't hear it properly. So there's another thing which is called ADR, alternate dialogue recording, which is in most of the movies, now the technology has changed, but previous, uh, previous time, like five, seven years ago or 10 years ago, uh, what used to happen is you would record everything on location, which is your reference audio. Then you get into the studio, 
and you lip sync everything again with the actual actor, which is your ADR, to have the clear sound. But you have to make sure the emotions are right and the lip sync correctly and the, uh, the, the audio doesn't feel disconnected. The other thing is, we have been seeing this videos. I don't know if everyone has seen this, but these called follies. You need to know what's my ambient sound like. If I'm doing something like mic'd up inside, then you might not get the ambient, but it's important that uh, to give the idea and the feel of the surrounding, we need to add that. So whether they're walking on a snow or a grass or, or a, a normal concrete floor, whatever, each sound is going to be different when you're walking through them. Um, and then similarly, if I'm touching my shirt, just fixing it up, somebody's doing their watch, there's a specific sound to it. You can mimic, you doesn't have to have the exact thing. But follies are important to add that ambience of the surrounding. And last thing is obviously the music. It plays an important part to uh, express the emotions uh, of the character or the situation. Um, it all has to gel in nicely to 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 make it uh, like a cinematic um, feel. Um, post production wise, I would also say there are a few softwares uh, majorly used as DaVinci, but you might have heard of there is also uh, Adobe Premiere uh, Pro or Final Cut that uh, you can choose to edit. It allows you to do actually everything from animation to basic uh, text animation, color grading, sound balancing, editing the footage, or um, uh, putting a transition, smooth transition, you can do it all. Um, I think that's the part of my post-production. If there are any questions, uh, you can align. Uh, we are still open for the questions. My last part would be using AI. So now, like I spoke earlier, Many of you wouldn't have the crew or the budget to have the crew, the equipment, the lighting and the camera and everything. And I gave you an example of, it was just my quick thought process of, assuming if I have to create everything all via AI, then how do I do that? There are uh, softwares, uh, mid-journey, you might have heard about it. You can literally just write a sentence about what, what do you think the video is going to be like. And that visual, you can, whatever you like, you can import that into a software called Frame.io and that converts that visual into a moving image or a short video, it could be two seconds, four seconds, and you can com uh, combine them. So before showing the example, uh, I will share the idea that, like I said earlier, I was always amazed by this, and I still have this, I don't know, my goal to create this video sometime whenever I can uh, about the conference of God. Uh, it's very close to my heart that I want to create this uh, full-fledged movie sometime. Uh, the conference of God is about the birds and their characterization going through the valleys and finding, searching for uh, the leader and they find out eventually it's them and themselves everything inside. Uh, but if I want to say those birds and their characterization is in a real world with a tribe and the people and they are going through the valleys, how that would look like. Uh, and then what AI gives me is what I'm going to show you now. And then I can also convert that into um, a video. Just before that, I'm going to show you one more image that I tried. That if Obama was in a Karachi or Indian street setting, <laughs> Some chola batula or whatever. That's what AI gave me. So maybe a value of fire is, was one of them, and the AI gives me this. If the value of fire was like this, people are going to that. This is again a place they are they are walking through. They are they are going through together, and basically mid journey created my thought process into this. I can put this image into Premio and make it into a moving image and. and um, and create a video. Uh, amazing example again here. Uh, these are the, maybe the distraction as well. They are going through, they are seeing something and just distracted by the worldly things. Uh, that was one of the forms of the bird. So 
this is from my hand uh, explaining what pre-production, production, post-production post -production is. If you have any questions, I'm open to it. So uh, looking forward to any questions, if you have, we do. We have one. Um, as you said, sound is very important. Is it worth to hire a sound engineer if you have a budget? I would definitely recommend a sound engineer if you have the budget because sound is the key. Even if your footage is not great, but if your sound is perfect, it would give you the feel, the clarity of uh, the emotions and, and the feel, feel of it. So, would definitely recommend.